we continue our series together as we talk about purpose-filled living. Remember, our foundation is Jesus Christ and who that we are. We stand on that foundation in good times and in bad times, and then we begin to build the walls of our faith as we're in the Word of God, as we pray together, as we worship together, as we do family and discipleship together. That's who we are. Now, let's be honest. Let's be honest. As you live your life, you face a lot, isn't it true? I mean, this, this week, God's done amazing things that we've just said together. But also, God's done anointed things, things that only God can do. And I'm telling you, I stand here today only because of God. But also this, I want to tell you, in the last seven days, not only has He anointed, not only has there been amazing things, but there's been an all-out assault on the body of Christ. Anybody experienced that? There's been all-out assault on the body of Christ. But here's my testimony today, Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 31, the the horse is made ready for the battle, but the victory is the Lord's. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be unto God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm here today to tell you that because of Christ, you can live purposely and bypass all the insignificant things. You can bypass all the hard things and walk through them under the anointing of God because God uses everything, amen, to grow the body of Christ. So whatever you come in here, here with today, God says, give it to me. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to use it if you live purposely in your life. Now, I'm going to begin here in Acts chapter 4, just an overview. I did this with our staff in devotion this, this week. Just an overview in verse 32 and following of how they work together, because today we're talking about, in our core values, it's a team effort. Say that with me. It's a team effort. It takes all of us to do the work of the kingdom. This is what they did. Look in verse 32. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Literally, because the Scripture says they were all united, it was a miracle, wasn't it? They were all united. So God's goal for our lives is that we be united as a team. Now watch. No one said any of the things that belonged to him was his own. In other words, they used pronouns like we instead of me. Well, they used things like us and I instead of I. That's who they were. They had everything in common. And notice what it said. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was upon them all. When a church is united, its leaders have power in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? We're seeing that ever. Doors are opening everywhere outside the walls, locally, nationally, and globally. We're, we're, getting, we're getting requests to go everywhere here in our city, all over the place. People are just going everywhere, doing everything, because we're united. Watch this. In our core values, we're in the Word together. We are worshiping together. We're praying together. We are a family together, and God is doing something amazing. Now, here's our core value, number five. Look as it comes on the screen. Here's what we believe. We believe that service and mission are God's tools to extend the kingdom of God. Say amen if you believe that. Behind those words are a group of our people doing missions, sitting together at one of our block parties, which is getting ready to come again in March. That's who we are. Whether we are in the house or whether we are out of the house, we are a team. We are a team sometimes dispersed. Sometimes we're a team that's gathered together, but we are a team. The Bible says we weep together, we cry together, we rejoice together, we celebrate together. Now notice what it says in verse 34, and there was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold, and they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each one as anybody had need. They were united together. Their leaders were free to take the gospel. Now watch this. And everybody was given sacrificial of their time, their talent, and their treasure. Isn't that amazing? I see that in the body of Christ everywhere God is working. When you see our church gathered together, it's not just one group. I love that. On, on Friday night, uh, Miss Allison, the oldest one was over 80 that, that, that was there was a buddy. And the youngest one, 18, 17, something like that. Now watch, the body of Christ working together. Josh Smith, pastor and author over in Athens, said this. Many of our kids go to his church during the week. Look as it comes on the screen. He says this, God's plan for the church is for us to be a place where multi-generational investments are being made. Aren't you glad you go to a church where they don't pass you by? Aren't you glad you go where they don't put you out to pasture? Oh, I love that. They don't put you out to pasture or they don't say you're too young and you can't do it. God is using all people at all times and all places to grow the kingdom of God. And here's what we do. We go all over the world, but we have the same goal that we are going to reach people, then we're going to teach them, and then we're going to develop them together as a team 
as a family, and then we're going to send each other and go with each other around the world. That's why we have core values. So can I ask you these quick questions? They're not on the screen. Can I ask you this question? Are you a part of the team? Now, in this early service, I suspect that most all are. The next, next service, there'll be about 50 to 60 percent that are. Are you a part of the team? Secondly, what's your role on the team? Your role may be in the house. About 40% of our people, their role is in the house. The other 60 of us, our roles are outside. Brother Danny, my role is as much outside as it is inside. It may be that I'm a truck driver. It may be that I'm doing parts deliverer. I may be a thousand other things, but I'm a part of the team who, who extends the kingdom by the way that I live out there in the world. So, so let me ask you this question now. Have maybe you gotten off a team and it's time you get back on a team? Maybe, maybe for a period of time, but because of some things, some circumstance in your life, you just kind of got away and God says, come back and get on a new team or rejoin the team. Uh, recently, God brought some folks back who used to be here before me and they said, wow, the church has changed and God is working. But they realized this, not only had the church changed, but they had changed. Isn't God good? Let's give him praise in his house of who he is. Now, the New Testament church uh, had many great churches that, that were doing these things that we're mentioning today, and one of them was the church at Ephesus. If we had time, we'd read Acts 19, where Paul went there and stayed two years. The gospel went everywhere. A great church was birthed in the midst of hell, and they did a great work there. He would write to them a letter called the book of Ephesians, telling about their duty in Christ, the doctrine of the grace of God. But then he would have to do something else. He would have to send a letter to their pastor. Now, if you go with me in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 4, he sent a letter to the pastor, and he was telling the pastor, now this is how I want you to correct some things. I want you to teach them, we've already read that, to be people of the book, the Word of God. I want you to teach them to be a people who worship God. I want you to teach them to be a people of prayer, and I want you to teach them to be a people together who that, that, are, that, that are having discipleship the other six days of the week, so when they come together, the church is just amplifying what God's doing. But then we also know this, there was some heavy problems. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, that is the last days, some will depart from the faith and they will devote themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Through the insincerity of liars whose consciousness are seared. We see these things today, do we not, brothers and sisters? They forbid marriage and require absence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Now, that was what was going on in that day. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. That's all those donuts that they had back there in the back that I stood away from a while ago. He said, God says, I'm going to do something, and the legalism of the world today says we'll do it a different way. Now, notice verse number six is where we begin our time together. He's personally into Timothy, and he says, now, Timothy, if you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good servant. You see, when you're on a team, you are a servant. About a month and a half from now, when we're in 2 Timothy 2, Paul will say this, the Lord's servant. When was the last time that you wrote out at the end of your email, the Lord's servant? We usually don't do that because there just seems a bad connotation. But I want to tell you, on our best days, we should be the Lord's servants. Now think about it. You listen to me. We don't serve ourselves. It's not about... When I'm the Lord's servants, I don't quit when it gets hard. When I'm the Lord's servant, I, you know, when somebody dumps on me a little bit, that may be my day to do that together that day. And when the reward comes, it's not for me. It's for my Lord because all I am, and it's a great thing to be, I am the Lord's servant. Now notice this. You're a good servant of Jesus being trained in the words of the faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. Now here is probably for us today if you've been under assault. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly men. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. Say godliness with me. For while bodily exercise, the King James Version said, or training is of some value. I believe in it with all my heart four to five days a week. It is of value to thee. But notice this, godliness is of value in every way. Why is it valuable, Paul? Because it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. When you are a part of a team, you're living purposely. Now, if that team is ungodly, you're living purposely for the wrong team for the wrong team leader. And there are people who are disunifiers. They are people that are on the wrong teams in, in this world today, and we should avoid them and stay away from that. But in our lives, we want to be God-like. 
When you're God-like, God blesses you here in this life. Now, some of you are saying, preacher, you're not scratching where I'm itching this morning. Well, it'll come together in a moment. Just, just keep, hold your itch out there. I'll scratch it in a moment. But I want you to hear this. We have to go line by line in the Word of God. Godness, living a God-like, blesses you here, but it holds a promise that someday in heaven you will not regret living godly. Now, you say, hear me, hear me. Right now, you need to hear this. Don't become ungodly. Don't respond to ungodliness with ungodliness. Respond to ungodliness with godliness. And there's a promise that God's going to do. Now, as we read on, this is where Timothy was. It was so tough on him. At the end of 1 Timothy, Paul will tell him to take some wine for his stomach, to settle his stomach. Friends, some of us today need to be reminded that you're on a team. You're not in it by yourself. We're in it together. Look in verse 9. The saying is trustworthy. I love this. The saying is trustworthy. In other words, what I'm about to write, you can trust this, and it deserves full acceptance. In other words, everybody in the family of God, not just in the church at Ephesus, but in every church and every should accept this. For to this end, we toil and strive. Why? Because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Now think about this. A team member is somebody who says, I want to be a part of God's team, I'm going to be in the Word of God. I'm going to be a worshiper. I'm going to be a constant praying. And I'm going to, in my own home, we're all going to get on the team of the Lord Jesus Christ. When my daddy got saved, let me tell you, everybody started getting in love with Wednesday night. Everybody got in love with the Bible because my dad did not insist. My dad led from the front. And men lead from the front. Men lead from the front, no matter your age. Say, well, my wife's superior to me. She's not superior to God. Wife, keep leading in, leaning in as God would have you to do. But now think about this. He says, we toil and we strive. To toil means this, you work hard. You see, all of us work hard, do we not? I, I think of Amber, who, who, who danced the night away with, with one of the most active ever participants in a night to shine probably in the world. I looked at five minutes into her helping that, this guy. He was spinning her around. And he did that for the whole night. The whole night. So I asked her this morning, are you sore? She said, more than I've ever been in my life. She labored. How many of you labored this week? If you look at our mechanics in the room, their hands are cut. If you look at the wives in the room and the ladies in the room, of all that you do, we labor in the kingdom of God. Paul labored. I actually have a little sciatica problem this morning. I labor with my hands and with my heart. Not only that, we labor, 2 Timothy 3 and 8, night and day. You see, God's team members, they, they, they labor, but also this, they strive. The word strive means that you stay at it day and night. You work at being unified. I told our staff, you have to work every day at being unified with people because people speak the wrong thing, don't they? People say the wrong, we say the wrong thing. So you have to work at it every day when it's popular and when it's unpopular. Because of the great blessing of the labors of people here in this church, I have the privilege of being connected with many places around the world. And because of this church and what we do, I get to hear the stories and see them firsthand. Do you know as we labor and toll in the gospel in China right now, they're getting saved sometimes a thousand people per day? Do you know in North Africa right now, Muslims are coming to, a, a, to the Lord at the greatest amount of time ever in the history of the world? Do you know that in other places, people, are, they're coming by the great droves. In our church, they're coming day by day, day by day, slowly, but they're coming, they're coming. I think about Brother Steve over the Jackson Nazarene Church, faithful for 10 years. And finally, after the ninth plus year of his ministry, the church is now taking off and growing. They're baptizing next Sunday. A couple of our pastors are over there a couple of weeks ago. Some places happen slowly, but those who labor and toil, it is never useless. And I want to encourage you to, some of you have prayed a prayer maybe 20 years. Now is going to be your time. Because God has said, now that because you're on my team, you've been faithful and you're laboring, and I'm going to do an amazing work in your life. You say, Pastor, how does it work? Write this reference down, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 3, you may have time to even flip over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10. Listen about their unity. Here's what Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He who plants and he who waters are one. In other words, the one who first shares the gospel and the one who comes along and waters it by taking food to them, by caring for them, inviting them to church, the one who lives the life in front of them, he waters their one, and each will receive his reward or wages according to the labor. For we are God's fellow workers. 
You are God's field. We work in your field. i got to pause here for a moment. There was a guy here Friday night. He was telling me about a new job he has in Alabama. I know all of Alabama is a mission field. Can I get an amen with that? It's all, we're all mission field people. But he's there talking about his job, and he was complaining just a very little bit. He says, man, they all lost on my job. He said, it is so hard. I said, praise the Lord. God has just given you a field. He said, what, what? I said, why don't you begin a Bible study uh, one day a week in your, right there in your, in, in, in your place? They'll let you do it. He said, oh, they won't do it. I said, let me tell you about Gulfstream. When I was in Savannah, Gulfstream uh, had all these employees, still do, and one guy in our church got under conviction by the Lord. He began a Bible study there on Gulfstream. Within three months, he had so many. He had to go to a church close by it. And as, as of today, they have 400 people who come every Wednesday in that place. Why? Because your field is wherever you are. And our job as a team is to give you the Word of God, to teach you, to help you develop, and to send you. And when you let us, we're going to go with you in the work of the Lord. Now watch this. According to the grace of God given to me, Paul writes, I'm a master builder. I laid a foundation. Someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds upon it. Friend, listen to me. Some of you in this room need to wake up to reality. Young lady, young man, that you have been given a gift to live in Jackson, and you know so many people. God help you to get a burden, a deep burden to reach all of your friends and go after them. To go, Amen. To go after them with all your heart. Some of us have forgotten. Some of us have been saved so long we forgot. The world needs the Lord Jesus Christ. We need lost people in this building more and more as we have all the time. We need people to reach in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go after them. You didn't go to high school with them and college with them and elementary school for nothing. God called you to them. God gave you communication and media to go after them. You say, well, Pastor, I want to be on the team. Praise the Lord. Let me give you three from Paul, quick benefits of being on the team. Number one is this, you impact people with the good news. He says in verse 11 of 1 Timothy 4, command and teach these things. You see, it was, Tim, it was Timothy's job to, to command, to be the pastor, to be the leader. It's what I try to do with you. But what is he announcing? He's announcing the good news. Go back with me to chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. Remember the good news in verse 3? It is good and is pleasing sight of God our Savior, verse 4, who desires all people to be saved. Yes, that one who's dogging on you, the one who's against you, the one who just comes and every time they come you want to spit. That's the one. God wants that they would be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God. One mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom from all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. The proper time is now. People are wanting to know now. Listen to me. They sat spellbounded. uh, About 80, 80 caregivers sat spellbounded in the fellowship hall without the air working and the wonderful food from our team that they, they sat there as I began to speak. They just, they locked to me. They, one man laid his head down on his table, began to weep, and he was the first one to raise his hand that he got born again. People need the Lord. And it is your time and my time. You say, but now pastor, I'm not a preacher. I anticipated you saying that. I just anticipate. And I sat down, and I, st- I went down through this. Can you hang with me? Buckle up your belt. You're going to hear you somewhere in this. Here's who we are to be. We are to be spiritual doctors who prescribe the cure. We're to be counselors who offer the remedy for their darkness. We are to be architects who draft the plan of the gospel. We're to be coaches who coach people to Jesus. We're to be educators who teach people how to be saved. We're to be mechanics who fix the problem. We're to be electricians who light the way. We are to be brokers who connect the dots. We're to be cleaners who clean the stains of sin. That's who we are to be in Jesus Christ. And I just hit a few of you. And I could do more. I I, I forgot the plumbers in the room, brother. I'm sorry. I'll do that in the next service. Stay for the next service. That's who we are. And God has said, I want you to command and teach. We teach formally. When they come to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we we teach formally on the anointing of the Word of God. But we teach informally. You know what informally teaching is? It's when that you're coaching the team and carrying the package and leading the team meeting, driving the forklift, my brother. It's when that you're serving in an operating room. It's when that you are caring for your kids. You go out to the park, and there you are sitting at the park, and you go over to someone else whose kid's off the chain, and you said, I've been there, but I met Jesus. And it's a thousand other open doors that we have been given in this last day time. And I want to invite you today to become a part of that team. 
You see, that we are blessed by God to impact people the good news. But secondly, we are blessed, we impact people by the way that we live. You see, it's not, it's not just saying it, it's doing it. And it's not just doing it and not saying it. Romans 10, 14 through 17, they cannot be saved apart from the Word. So if someone says, uh, you know, share the gospel, and if you have to use words, that's from hell. They can't get saved apart from Jesus. That's just don't believe that. You, you've got to know the gospel. But here he says in verse 12, let no one despise you for your youth. Now, we read that so often times, and, and we, we, we throw this out here, and we say that, that Paul was saying to Timothy that you're a young man, and let no one put you down because you're young. I don't believe that at all. When you go to 2 Timothy 2 and 22, he says this, that you're to flee youthfulness. Many of us never grow up. We never mature in our walk with Christ. We are not to be childish. We are to be childlike. Childish people uh, say the wrong things, do the wrong things, act the wrong way, go the wrong way. They're, they're always about themselves. But when we are impacted as a team, that team, you know, shows up and says, it really isn't about me. I'm so thankful that I serve in a church where that I'd be lying if I said 100% we're that way because we're all growing. We've got young children in our church spiritually and physically. We've got students in our church spiritually and physically. We've got young men in our church spiritually and physically, young women. We've got matures. They're all over the board. But listen to me, we are training people and developing them to do the five things that he puts before us here. He says, set the believers an example five ways. First of all, in your speech. How, is, how was your speech this week and how was mine? When, when, when we, listen to me, when we are a team, what we say counts. Colossians 4 and 6, let your speech be seasoned with salt. We are not to be wimps, we're to be warriors, and sometimes the greatest warrior that you have is fighting your own mouth. Can I get an amen? amen? Like This is what I want to say. I am so glad that when the Holy Spirit changes your life, the first thing that He changes is your speech. Someone recently at some point was saying, why didn't you respond to so-and-so in a so-and-so way? Because it's not in my speech anymore. You say, well, I, you know, I, I'm just a military man, so cursing was a part of my life. It doesn't have to be. Pastor Kerry, who's now a full bird colonel, will tell you this, that he's with military men seven days with 24 hours a day. It's not the toughest place in the world. He don't curse his all of his day. Why? Because Christ has touched his speech. Friend, let's do, let Christ touch your speech. He said this, be, be an example in your conduct, the way you behave. You see, you, you are who you are in the tough moments. You are who you are in the, when you're away from people. 1 Timothy 1 16 says that grace overflows. I love it when your conduct honors the Lord. And friend, today I just want to ask you this, to become a part of a team that's impacting people by the gospel, impacting people by the way that we live. But there's one other one that he gives us here. We impact people by our devotion to God. See, it's really ultimately how you walk with Almighty God. Because I'm going to tell you this, there will be times when nobody will walk with you. There'll be things that you and God alone, I'm rereading Job this morning, the first, first part of the book of Job this morning, and you know, it came to the point that Job had nobody but God. Job was righteous and upright before God. He had nobody but God. And when his wife told him to curse God and die, he said, woman, you're acting like an unbeliever. How can we not accept good from God, but also accept difficulty from God? And then Job did not sin with his life. You see, here, Paul to Timothy says in verse 13, look at this, now until I come. Now, he would never end up coming, Brother Danny. He wanted to. He said, Timothy, I know it's hard, but until I get there, and he won't get there, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. This was his assignment. What is your assignment? Are you devoted to God in your assignment? I will do this if no one ever acknowledges me because I'm doing it for God. Because I love him. I could never do enough for this one. You know, uh, I, I, you know, I never planned to retire from ministry. I planned to someday to get out of the way and not be a hindrance. But I can't, I can't quit what I've devoted my life to do. I don't have a job. I have a calling. And friend, you may have an earthly job, but you have an eternal calling. Now look what he says in verse 14. Do not neglect the gift you have. Now think about this, which was given to you by prophecy with the counsel of the elders laid their hands on him. Let's apply it to Tim Timothy. Don't quit now. Remember all those guys that gathered in that circle and laid hands upon you? Now I want to apply this to your life today. Certainly you do not have the same call as Timothy did. They, people haven't laid hands upon you, but God has. The word neglect means simply this, that you take your eyes off the ball. 
If you're a baseball player and take your eyes off the ball, you're going to miss it every time. Do not neglect. Listen to me. The devil is always in the business. He is brilliant. He's a genius right here. We say things like this. He, the devil whispers, take a break. Doesn't he say that? Can I get an amen? He says, that you're burning out. His plan is genius because when you cease doing what you're called to do, when you're not all up in it, you cease thinking about where your service is. You, you don't long for it. You get away from it and you don't want to do it because you're not there. You're not in your field. You're not seeing it. You cease feeling love toward others. They're not on your radar. You begin to fill your time with other fleshly things. And before long, you're completely out because you've quit devoting yourself. Friend, God has called you to be devoted. And he says to practice, which means to meditate on. To meditate means you're all in. you totally up in. you absorbed with God. Many people have never been absorbed with God. But I'm telling you, there's a generation that is coming that's now getting absorbed with God. And you need to be in that generation to immerse yourself. Give all that you have. <coughs> Listen to what the Bible says. So that your progress would be seen. That's what it is. Your progress would be seen. It's just like that. When somebody's trying to lose weight, I always point it out, don't you? Well, maybe you don't. You know why? Because it's an encouragement, my brother. It's an encouragement to say to somebody, I see your progress. I want to ask you this. When was the last time that your spouse or a friend or a minister or someone that you value says, I can tell you're growing in Christ. If no one's telling you that, for many of you in this room, I want to look at you as your pastor and tell you, you're growing in Christ. You're on a team and you are growing in Christ. I want to celebrate you and say thanks be unto God for each of you. You're growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. The last thing that he says, you're keep, verse 16 and we're done. Keep a close watch on yourself. You see this? Listen, this, write this down. You are spiritually clearing the path for others. It's coming on the screen. You're spiritually clearing the path for others. Keep a close watch on yourself. I think about if I fail and become miserable in the walk of Christ, Brother Lane, it would affect your life. See, you're, you're keeping a watch on yourself and on your teaching. And then he says this, persist in this. Timothy, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and those who hear. You say, are, are you saying you can lose your salvation? No, he doesn't say that at all. But by your very testimony, you're proving that you are saved. How, how many people have lost their marriage because they failed to watch this, to keep a close watch? How many people have lost their place in their walk with God because they failed? Now, here's why they failed. Because they did not stay with the team. There's no way that I can get away with not reading my Bible for two days. This man and this man and this man would wear me out. There's no way that I can live a life where I'm even leaning toward a woman of the opposite sex other than my wife because these men would not let that happen. They're on my team. There's no way that we financially could do anything that's inappropriate. That man sits right up there as our chairman, and we have a team of individuals in our church, and I, ha I write no check, have no authority to write any check in this church. Why? Because we're a team. And I want to tell you this. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 how terrible he said this. He said, there are many people who know not the gospel, and I say this to your shame. Friend, I want to tell you, in our city and beyond, they cannot say that we have not come to them with the gospel because we are a team of people. And I want to encourage you today to say this, that God wants you to be on the team. So we're done now. So here's the question. Ask God, are you on the team? Just ask God. Are you on the team? If you don't know Jesus Christ, I want to plead with you today. Be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Listen, you're feeling that heart, that call of God upon your life. He loves you more than you love yourself. He, listen to me. He's the forgiving God. He's the healing God. He'll give you a new heart. Because some of you said, I can't be a Christian because I can't do those things. God never asked you to do it. He does it. All you got to do is lean into him. Not only be saved, but God wants you to serve. God wants you to serve a local church. You say, Keith, can I serve at Jackson First Baptist Church? If you are breathing and you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we want you to come and serve, whether it's a greeter, whether it's an usher, whether it's a person who serves out in the community with us. We want you to serve. And so today, get connected. Ask God what you can do. I don't know what your gifting and talent is, but I know this, that God is just using people everywhere. 
We should be people in our public school system, in our private school system. We should be people in the law enforcement. We should be people in everything that's going on in Jackson that is godly or has the potential to be godly. We should be involved locally, nationally, and globally. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you will reach out to us at info at jacksonfbc.com with your questions. And check out more of our ministries at jacksonfbc.com.